Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Thomas Mueller. I'm the Director of Applications for the AFM business at Brooker. I'd like to welcome you to this installment of the Brooker AFM webinar series. This presentation today is titled The Bioscope Resolve AFM from Correlated High-Resolution Imaging of Single Biomolecules to Investigating Cell Mechanics. It is presented uh, jointly today by Dr. Andrea Slade from Brooker and Dr. Hermann Schillers from the University of Münster. Before I introduce Andrea and Hermann, I'd like to make a few quick logistical comments. First, we encourage your participation during the webinar. If you have a question, please type it into the questions dialog box on your screen. We'll accumulate the questions through the presentation and group them together and then answer them at the end of our prepared remarks. Quite often, we have more questions than we can answer in the session, and in those cases, we'll follow up with email. Also, if you'd like to review the presentation afterwards or pass it on to a colleague, the webinar will be posted online within a week in the webinar section of our Brooker webpage. You'll also receive an email with this link. Now, finally, when you exit the webinar software, you'll be asked to take a brief survey. We'd uh, very much appreciate if you would take the time to complete this, as it helps us pick the topics that are most important to you and uh, generally helps us to make this series better. So let's get started and let me introduce our presenters. Dr. Andrea Slade is a senior application scientist in the AFM unit of Brooker's nanosurfaces business. Andrea received her PhD in biochemistry and biomedical engineering in 2004 from the University of Toronto, Canada, where she worked on the integration of optical microscopy and spectroscopy <coughs> with AFM for the study of biological membranes and membrane protein interactions. Since joining Brooker 10 years ago, Andrea has been focused on life science applications and AFM education and biological research. Andrea has over 15 years of uh, experience in biological AFM with over a dozen peer-reviewed publications and has given numerous mm -hmm. seminars and presentations worldwide. Uh, our second presenter today, Dr. Hermann Schillers, is a group leader in the Oberleitner Lab at the Institute of Physiology Medical School at the University of Münster. Hermann received his PhD in chemistry in 1997 and has 17 years of experience with AFM on biological samples. He successfully used AFM to determine protein distribution in isolated cell membranes for live cell imaging for quantification of biomechanical properties of live cells and cell-cell, as well as cell protein adhesions. So uh, let me turn it over now to uh, first to Andrea to begin this presentation titled The Bioscope Resolve AFM from Correlated High-Resolution Imaging of Single bi Biomolecules to Investigating Cell Mechanics. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. So for the first part of this webinar, I'll introduce Brooker's new BioAFM, the Bioscope Resolve, and give you an overview of its new features and capabilities. Then Herman will present some of the scientific work where he used the Bioscope Resolve to obtain some very remarkable images of microvilli on living cells. So let's get started. Brooker has quite a successful reputation for building AFMs that have long been used in leading biological research, as well as in the biotechnology industry. The Multimode was the first commercial AFM and still has the largest number of peer-reviewed research publications for obtaining high-resolution images of single biomolecules and fluids. In 2012, Bruker released the Dimension FastScan Bio AFM. The FastScan Bio enables researchers to obtain high-resolution and high-speed images of biomolecules, where images that once took several minutes to capture now only take a few seconds. With this increased speed of image acquisition, researchers are now able to use AFM to study the dynamics of molecular and cellular behavior. Bruker also has a line of AFMs that have been specifically designed to be integrated with light microscopy. This combined platform allows researchers to register their optical field of view to the AFM scan area and then use optical images from transmitted light or fluorescence techniques to obtain correlated optical and AFM data sets. 
The latest system in this line, the Bioscope Resolve, is not only designed to operate on an inverted light microscope, it has many new features and capabilities that take it far beyond the performance of its predecessors and makes it the unrivaled bioAFM for high resolution imaging and mechanobiology studies. In the following slides, I'll discuss each of these features in greater detail, but briefly for now, the Bioscope Resolve offers the most comprehensive package for studying the nanomechanical properties of both cells and molecules. Not only have we made improvements to peak force Q&M operations, specifically for measurements on very soft living cells, we've also added a new mode that we call fast force volume, which not only extends both the speed and flexibility <coughs> of our traditional force volume mode, but also complements peak force Q&M measurements. Resolve also enables the highest resolution imaging capabilities for an AFM that operates on an inverted light microscope. Whether it be studying small individual biomolecules such as proteins and DNA, or imaging large mammalian cells and bacteria. In fact, Resolve is now making live cell imaging easier with auto-optimization of certain scan parameters through scan assist mode, as well as new Resolve probes that eliminate common artifacts associated with imaging these taller, soft cell structures. And of course, one of the key aspects of the Bioscope Resolve is the integration with light microscopy. Unlike other bioAFMs, Resolve provides full integration and more importantly, full synchronization fully implemented synchronization of the AFM with light microscopy techniques. <clears throat> the new software interface allows mode switching and programming of sequential AFM measurement sites for automated data collection. And important for any bio-AFM, Resolve also provides excellent sample handling and environmental control for advanced biological studies. With regards to sample handling, the Bioscope Resolve supports the use of polystyrene and glass bottom petri dishes, standard glass slides, and glass cover slips. As you can see in the image on the top right, Resolve provides both visual and physical access to the sample. This not only allows researchers to clearly see the position of the cantilever holder relative to the sample substrate, but also to access the sample with a micropipette for the addition of imaging fluid or other solutions, such as a drug or a binding ligand. In terms of accessories, the Bioscope Resolve includes the Easy Align probe loading station, shown on the bottom left of the slide. As the Resolve uses an 850 nanometer SLD for deflection detection, which is in the near IR, the Easy Align facilitates alignment of the SLD relative to the AFM cantilever in both air and fluid. <clears throat> the Easy Align can also be used to hold the head during experiments when a user needs to adjust or exchange a sample. Because it works in fluid, a user can keep their probe hydrated during this time, helping to ensure the quality of the AFM probe for the duration of their study. This is especially important when using modified probes where maintaining the functional activity of the molecule on the end of the tip is imperative to the success of the experiment. The Bioscope Resolve also has a new cantilever holder design. The holder is made of a durable and biocompatible peak material that's black in color in order to minimize scattering or reflection of light from the inverted scope. And with a clip fastened to probe mount and taller cylindrical shape, loading probes and working in petri dishes with several millimeters depth of fluid is made much easier. There's also a microvolume cell shown in the middle photo on the bottom of the slide, which works nicely when using expensive or small quantities of sample. Made up of a silicone boot that fits over the end of the cantilever holder, the microvolume cell forms a fully enclosed fluid environment, having a total volume of 60 microliters when sealed against the sample surface. It also has inlet and outlet ports, which can be connected to tubing to allow for the exchange of fluid within the cell. An optional accessory for the Bioscope Resolve is the sample heater, which allows heating of fluid samples up to 60 degrees. We also have a perfusing stage incubator, or PSI, which provides a sealed environment for extended live cell studies. The PSI works with glass bottom petri dishes and allows perfusion of imaging fluids such as cell medium, as well as control of the gaseous environment immediately surrounding the cells. <clears throat> the PSI can also be used with a sample heater for those wanting to conduct cell studies at elevated temperature, for example, maintaining cells at 37 degrees. And lastly, the Bioscope Resolve also has the option of top view optics, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> shown in the bottom right image, which is used to provide an optical image of the tip position relative to the sample surface when using opaque samples, so in the case where users can't collect images on such sample with the inverted microscope. The top view optics uses a kinematic mount to sit directly on the resolve head so that it can be used while the AFM is on the scope or as a standalone configuration. 
The image produced by the top view optics, as well as the motor controls for adjusting the camera focus and zoom, are all accessible within the AFM software. <clears throat> now, the Bioscope Resolve also has a brand new software interface, Nanoscope version 9.2. For those of you familiar with Bio Bruker's Bioscopes AFMs, you've heard of Moreau, our microscopy image registration and overlay software, in which the AFM scan area is registered to the optical field of view, and then the optical images are used to guide the AFM to regions of interest on the sample on which to perform AFM measurements. Now, on the Bioscope Resolve, Moreau is fully integrated into the software as a single view, known as Moreau View, which allows users to not only control but also view AFM measurements being executed in real time that are directly correlated to optical images. To register the AFM and optical microscope, Moreau View has a fully automated 25-point registration procedure for each microscope objective that's saved directly in the software. This eliminates the need to conduct the registration process each time the software starts. <coughs> Another important and unique capability of the new Resolve software that greatly improves the ease of use of the overall system is the ability to switch operational modes while the AFM probe is engaged on the sample surface. Up to now, to switch modes, users would have to withdraw their probe from the surface, load a new experiment workspace, adjust parameters, and then re-engage their tip. Now to simply switch data collection from, say, peak force QN and mapping to force volume or to force spectroscopy, all a user does is click on the mode icon at the top of the screen and then draw the area over the optical image on which they wish to execute the measurement. As you can see in the screenshot of the software interface <coughs> here, peak force Q&M, force volume, and single force ramp measurements have all been performed on the same sample, all within the same workspace. In addition to mode switching, Resolve now also enables users to set up multiple measurement sites on a sample and then program the system to sequentially execute and automatically collect the AFM data. This can be combined with mode switching, thereby allowing multiple measurement types to be collected on the same location on the same sample surface. Another important change of the Resolve software is that now it automatically captures all the data. So there's no need for the user to remember to click on the capture button to ensure that they don't miss collecting any important data. But because we're now collecting every image and every force curve performed, not just the ones the user specifically indicated they want captured, we need to be smart on how the data is organized and how to make it easy to review. For this, we have two new features in the Resolve software. First is a three-star user rating system that users can very quickly select to indicate important and relevant data and then sort all their data based on the ratings. The other feature that we've implemented for optimizing data organization is what we call data history. When a user selects a single area in the Moreau view on which data was collected, say here where we collected the Peak Force Q&M image, all the data files associated with that location are listed separately from the general browse view, which contains every image regardless of the location. Users can then open and view and process these images, knowing exactly where they were obtained on the sample surface in direct correlation to the optical image. Now, while there are several bio-AFMs on the market that offer physical integration with light microscopy and registration of both techniques in order to optically guide the AFM to specific locations on a sample surface, the Bioscope Resolve is the only bio-AFM that, in addition to this, provides synchronization of AFM and optical data collection and is fully implemented within the AFM software. With the Bioscope Resolve, both the acquisition and automatic import of registered optical images is fully integrated for both transmitted light and advanced fluorescence techniques with image acquisition through a CCD camera or a confocal microscope. Optical images can be automatically acquired at the end of each scan line, at the end of each AFM image, or during force curve measurements, either at the end of the approach or the end of the retract curve. Now, at the end of an experiment, correlated AFM and optical data can be post-processed, including playbacks of videos created from the collected optical images in Nanoscope's Movie Maker. <clears throat> As an example of Resolve synchronization capabilities, we have here a video showing synchronization of AFM and confocal imaging of MDCK cells. Okay. Get the movie started. Um, so here the cell cytoskeleton is fluorescently labeled with Alexafluor 546 phalloidin, and confocal images are being acquired every 25 seconds during the AFM image. Each time a confocal image is captured, it's automatically imported into the AFM software. And as you can see, each confocal image is fully registered and does not interfere with the collection of the AFM image. 
We can also see changes in the level of detail in the confocal images. For example, if we look in the bottom left here, you'll see as each image is acquired, we're actually seeing a change or a fading of the fluorescent dye because we're deliberately photo bleaching the sample. <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, the Bioscope Resolve offers the most complete set of force measurement capabilities of any bioAFM. For studying the mechanical properties of molecules and cells, researchers can take advantage of three different methods for collecting this data. Peak force Q&M, fast force volume, and force spectroscopy, or single force curve measurements. Much of the design of the Bioscope Resolve has centered around making improvements to the performance of peak force tapping mode and especially peak force Q&M for measurements in fluid on very soft samples. Peak force Q&M operating frequencies <coughs> are now extended from 125 hertz up to 2 kilohertz. We've also implemented a unique petri dish sample holder which provides more reliable and consistent modulus measurements, as well as a new peak force Q&M dedicated probe for conducting measurements on soft samples such as cells. In fast force volume, we've extended the operating frequency of these linear ramps up to 300 hertz. Changes have also been made to how force volume images are collected, as well as improvements to the number of ramp and data channels that are now available. And in force spectroscopy, not only have we increased the rate at which force curves can be executed and collected, we also improved the sensitivity of the forces applied to the sample, where we can now trigger at applied forces as low as 50 piconewtons. When it comes to peak force Q&M property mapping of living cells, the Bioscope Resolve provides fast acquisition of mechanical property maps that are collected at the same scan rate and at the same high spatial resolution as corresponding topography images. Data can be collected at frequencies up to 2 kilohertz. We typically do about 1 kilohertz in fluid. <clears throat> and measurements of cell modulus are not only quantitative, but also highly repeatable independent of the sample, user, and probe, which I'll demonstrate on the next slide. So how does the Bioscope Resolve achieve these results? The answer is through a combination of unique instrument design and Bruker Peak Force Q&M probes specifically designed for studying live cells. <coughs> Pardon me. The, <coughs> the Bruker Peak Force Q&M live cell probe is a soft cantilever probe having a spring constant of about 0.08 newtons per meter and a very long tip about 17 microns long with a fixed end radius of about 65 nanometers. <coughs> By having a tall tip, the probe cantilever is extended away from the sample surface and helps improve the results of background subtraction used for removing the effects of viscous dampening on peak force Q&M force curves when we're operating in fluid. A fixed end radius also helps in fitting the various models for modulus calculations. The Bioscope Resolve also benefits from our new peak force tapping live cell background subtraction algorithm. When imaging living cells, there can be large topographical variations as the probe scans over the surface of the entire cell. This means that not only will the cantilever distance from the sample surface constantly change, but due to a squeeze film effect, the viscous damping or hydrodynamic forces acting on the probe will also change. As a result, this can cause substantial variations in the background from one force curve to the next as the probe scans over the surface. This can introduce artifacts into the curve used for force feedback as well as calculating mechanical property channels. The new live cell algorithm is implemented to dynamically subtract the background from each individual force curve in an image in order to restore the true interaction forces. Lastly, AFM systems that are integrated with an inverted light microscope have a sample stage with an aperture at the center to allow optical amps to access to the sample. While necessary for light microscopy, this is not really ideal for AFM as the aperture opening is exactly where AFM measurements are being conducted, unfortunately provides less mechanical support for the sample. Additionally, the petri dishes that are used as cell substrates are not man manufactured necessarily with perfectly flat bottoms and in fact often have a lip around the edge. Coupled together, what this all creates is essentially a drum head effect. The petri dish resonates during AFM measurements, which can not only affect the consistency of quantitative mechanical measurements, but also can limit imaging resolution. Now, all AFMs that operate on inverted scopes have this problem, but before the bioscope resolve, it wasn't really addressed. In developing resolve, a lot of effort was put into solving the issue. The result is now, rather than using clamps or holders that press against the top of the petri dish to immobilize it, the dish is held in place using vacuum that's incorporated into the sample stage. By directly holding the bottom of the dish, the drum head is effectively eliminated while still supporting standard polystyrene and glass bottom-tee petri dishes, and also maintaining optical access to the sample from below, 
even with high magnification oil immersion objectives. The Peak Force Q&M images shown here are live MDCK cells obtained with a bioscope resolve, with the topography image on the top and the corresponding modulus image on the bottom. The color scale having um, with the modulus image corresponds to increased modulus values, where darker colors are showing lower modulus and later colors are showing higher modulus. So keeping this in mind when looking at the modulus image, we can see long, thin structures corresponding to actin fibers that appear to have higher modulus being lightest in color, while cell surface structures, which we believe to be microvilli, appear softer or darker in color than the membrane itself. As I mentioned on the last slide, peak force Q&M measurements of cell modulus obtained with the Bioscope Resolve are not only quantitative, but also highly repeatable, independent of the sample, the user, or the probe. Here we have the results of peak force Q&M measurements obtained on agarose gel samples. These gels have moduli similar to that of biological samples, and by adjusting the percentage of the agarose used to make the gel, we can effectively change its stiffness, with higher percentage gels having higher modulus. Peak force Q&M measurements were performed on three different gels, a 1.25%, 2.5%, and 5%, at three different peak force Q&M operating frequencies, 1 kilohertz, 500 hertz, and 250 hertz. As expected, the resulting modulus values did increase for the higher percentage gels. You can also see that for each gel type, the measured modulus value increased with higher peak force Q&M frequencies. This could indicate some frequency-dependent behavior of the gel, perhaps even a viscoelastic effect. Nonetheless, the important thing to notice is that the relatively small standard deviation associated with each of the modulus values, indicating that despite being taken by multiple users that are using different probes as well as using different samples, there's very good consistency in these measurements. In the new fast force volume mode, we've increased the flexibility and productivity of Bruker's traditional force volume mode, which despite its limitations has been extensively used for studying the mechanical properties of cells. <coughs> in fast force volume, the ramp rate at which each individual force curve can be conducted has been increased from the typical 10 hertz limit up to 300 hertz. The number of ramp channels has increased from one to three, this allows users to plot and save the Z-sensor motion so that force curves can be conducted in open loop, which allows us to ramp faster and still obtain good quality curves. In addition, force volume images are now collected using rectangular bidirectional scanning, similar to what we do in imaging modes, which also helps to increase the speed at which the data is collected. There's also a new fast force volume view in the software, shown here on the slide, which includes a user-selectable ramp plot, you can see your force curve associated with each pixel in the force volume image, and four property data channels with the user's choice of height, <coughs> modulus, adhesion, and stiffness. In addition to increasing the speed at collecting force volume image, we've also increased the maximum resolution of the force volume data in both X, Y, N, and Z. For a 256 by 256 pixel force volume image, the maximum number of data points in each force curve has increased um, from 256 to 2048. Having a higher number of data points can be very important when analyzing force curves, especially when looking for specific adhesion or unbinding vents in the retract portion of the curve. And the maximum number of pixels now in a force volume image is 956 by 956, with 256 points in each force curve. Improvements have also been made in the analysis of force volume as well as peak force capture data. Users can create real height images of their sample, which is essentially the height calculated at the zero force um, or at the point of contact between the tip and the sample surface. These real height images often allow one to see finer details of the surface structure of very soft samples, such as cells, that can easily be deformed under the force of the AFM probe. The new ability to create density plots and contour plots also provides alternative views of force volume or peak force capture data which can offer unique insights into data trends and variations. The increased speed and flexibility of fast force volume mode on the Bioscope Resolve not only improves productivity, it also makes high resolution force volume maps practical, where once it was severely limited in the trade-off between speed and resolution. With the improvements made to peak force Q&M fast force volume that we've described, we now have closed the frequency gap between these two force mapping modes. This not only provides the Bioscope Resolve with the widest range of operating frequencies <coughs> for any bioAFM, from 0.1 hertz up to 2 kilohertz, as shown on the graph here, 
It also facilitates easy and direct comparison of force volume and peak force Q&M data and also opens up the possibility to investigate time-dependent sample properties and behavior such as viscoelasticity. Now up to this point in the presentation, we've concentrated on describing the nanomechanical property mapping capabilities of Resolve, but that's not all this new BioAFM can do. The Bioscope Resolve also enables the highest resolution imaging of biomolecules for an AFM that's integrated with an inverted light microscope. Here we have a Resolve image of plasma DNA obtained in peak force tapping mode and buffer solutions. As the feedback signal for peak force tapping mode is the maximum or peak force applied between the tip and the sample, it offers a great advantage to imaging soft biological samples that are susceptible to deformation by the tip. Using low imaging forces of about 70 piconewtons, we can see in the cross section taken along the DNA strand, as indicated by the dotted line on the image, that the peak force tapping mode accurately shows DNA as having a diameter or a height of about 2 nanometers. In addition to protecting delicate samples such as DNA from damage by maintaining low imaging forces, peak force tapping also makes imaging of fluid easier. There's no need for the requirement for use of specialized probes, and with the elimination of the need to tune the cantilever resonance, there's no longer a worry about peak fish shifting during an experiment. This helps to ensure that faster and more consistent data is obtained regardless of the user's skill level. But not only has the Bioscope Resolve been able to image DNA strands, Using the, new, uh, the highly sensitive force control <coughs> provided by peak force tapping, together with a new probe, um, the Scan Assist High Resolution Probe, which has a tip radius of less than 2 nanometers, we've been able to resolve the DNA double helix. As shown here on the left, where we clearly see the alternating major and minor grooves having widths of 2.2 and 1.2 nanometers, respectively, in both the image and the cross section. The Bioscope Resolve has also been able to obtain submolecular resolution of membrane proteins such as bacteria, or dobson, or BR using peak force tapping, as shown in the image here on the right. In this image, we clearly see the individual molecules that make up the three subunits of the BR trimer, as shown in the inset, as well as the defects within the lattice structure as indicated by the green circle. It's important to remember now that both of these images shown here were obtained while operating the AFM on an inverted microscope and not as a standalone configuration. So what's impressive about the Bioscope Resolve is that the same AFM that's able to achieve the high quality submolecular resolution images you just saw also has the flexibility and scanner range to image entire mammalian and bacterial cells at the micron level. And it can do so without the image artifacts that are commonly observed when imaging live cells by AFM. So how does the Resolve achieve this? First, Resolve has an XY scanner range of at least 100 microns and a Z range of at least 15 microns. This provides enough imaging range to image entire cell structures. Secondly, the Peak Force QNM live cell probe that we spoke about earlier has a 17 micron tall tip, as compared to the typical 3 to 4 micron tall tip, which makes it much easier to image cells that are several microns tall themselves and often have steep edges where they're not well attached or spread on the substrate surface. Even on bacterial cells, such as E. coli cells shown here on the right, which are typically less than a micron in height, but have very steep sidewalls due to their cylindrical rod-like shape. AFM images of rod-shaped bacterial cells often show squared edges on the ends of the rod rather than round edges, as well as doubling of one side of the cell, which are both due to tip artifacts. In the image shown here, obtained with Peak Force QNM Live Cell Probe, we have very nice rounded cell edges, no doubling of the side wall, and we can also see multiple flagella that are not only present on the substrate, but also seem to be draped over the tops of the cells themselves. The new peak force tapping live cell background subtraction algorithm that we introduced earlier also helps to improve both the ease and repeatability of live cell imaging. By removing the background from every force curve as the probe scans over the cell surface, we get a dramatic increase in the signal to noise or the signal to background, which increases the sensitivity at which the peak force is recognized. This allows peak force tapping imaging at very low forces, which is imperative for obtaining high-resolution AFM data on soft living cells. And lastly, the Bioscope Resolve has a scan assist mode specifically designed for live cell imaging. In typical AFM imaging, the gain is set to one specific value for an entire image. But when you're imaging a very soft cell that's attached to a comparatively hard substrate, such as glass or polystyrene, then the gain value can only really be optimized for one or the other, and not both. Scanus's cell not only maintains the user specified set point during imaging, it also automatically adjusts the gain settings as the probe image over the cell. 
so that it's optimized for both the cell and the underlying substrate, thereby effectively eliminating artifacts such as parachuting or noise from the resulting image. Ultimately, what all these new and improved features and capabilities of the Bioscope Resolve enable is new data and new research. So for the next part of this webinar, I will turn things over to Dr. Herman Schillers to present to you some very impressive scientific work using the Bioscope Resolve with peak force tapping to obtain high resolution images of microvilli for the first time on living cells. Okay, everybody. Um, I would uh, like to show or present the data we obtained with the Bioscope Resolve on um, MDCK cells, epithelial cells. And uh, as you know, the most challenging thing is to image soft and flexible structures. So this image you see here is not a MDCK cell, it's platelet. But uh, we go now to the uh, microvilli uh, story. Um, this image is, um, M shows uh, MDCK cells. And as you can see, there are not much resolution on top of the cells. So you usually get blurred images and insufficient resolution because the system you want to measure is touched by the tip. And the tip sample interactions uh, usually uh, change the surface structure and modifies what you see in the image. So the perfect system would be a system in which the probe sample interaction is nearly zero, and this avoids a change of the structure you want to image. So um, the peak force QNM probe is a real good improvement because uh, the long tip of 17 microns uh, allows to image surface structures, even on surface, surfaces with a large deviation of, of height. Yeah? So um, usually you get with short tips of, let's say, 5 microns, problems with shadowing because the cantilever touches the cell surface when the height difference is, is larger than the tip length. With a 17 micron tip, you do not have this problem any longer. And as Andrea mentioned before, the large distance between the cantilever and the surface reduce damping effects by <coughs> the hydrodynamic squeeze layer. So we use this, exactly this peak force QNM live cell probe to image um, uh, microvilli. And microvilli are common structures found on epithelial cells with a variety of functions in small intestine and uh, the renal tubules in the lung. So they're are responsible for adsorption, secretion, for cellular adhesion, for mid-canal transduction. Um, and they are not only on epithelial cells found, but also on white blood cells, oocytes, and several other cell types. So as you can see in this electron microscopy images, they are show lengths of, let's say, one micron or even more. And they are just an actin structure covered by a plasma membrane, which makes them very flexible and soft. And this is a challenging thing in imaging these microvilli. So these are the cells, the MDCK C11 cells. Um, as a fast contrast image. And as you could see in this image, the height differences within the cell layer are large. So this is challenging for a short tip, for a common tip, to avoid shadowing and to see all cells in, in the natural shape. And what we did is we use the uh, PFOS QMM probe and image first this glutar aldehyde fixed MDCK cells. And you could see nicely there's no shadowing effect. That's a good thing. And uh, regarding to the microvilli in the indicated um, square, we did a higher resolution scan. And what we could see are microvilli. But these microvilli are squeezed down to the surface of cells, um, they are nicely shaped, but not in the native configuration. They are fixed, and therefore they are stiff, and they are not flexible, and this is more easy to image them. But uh, on live cells, not on fixed cells, on live cells, it would be much more difficult. So this is now an image of a of living MDCK cell monolayer. And in the height sensor, and also in the deflection error channel, you could see no shadowing effects. 
The height differences here are above 10 micron, and uh, here the advantages of the long, 17 micrometer long QNM force tip are visible. So no shadowing effects and clear surface uh, curvature. So from the l overview, we came to a single cell, and uh, in this uh, 25 by 25 micrometer scan, you could see structures on the cell surface. So these structures are microvilli, but uh, they do not show like the microvilli as we saw them in the electron microscopy images, because uh, there is still some interaction between the tip and the microvilli and the microvilli are very flexible and therefore they are pushed, dragged, pulled and somehow by uh, the tip. So when we go closer to the cell, a 10 by 10 micrometer scan at a peak force set point of 170 piconewton, which is rather low, we see structures. But uh, it's not like we saw it on the electron microscopy images. This is more a waving rain field, so there are structures, and obviously these structures are moved around by tip sample interactions. So 170 piconewtons is a rather low force, and for most instruments it's difficult to get this low force control. We go further and reduce force down to a peak force set point of 28 piconewton, and the system still cracks we get a surface. And on this image, you could clearly see this microvilli. Not very, yeah, they, they are pretty sharp. Um, and in the deflection error image, you could see it even better. These microvilli uh, have a length of 500 to one micro, 500 pico nanometer to one micrometer, and a diameter of, let's say, 300 nanometer. They are cylindrical and um, showing a nice configuration. So 28 piconewton is uh, very close to the limit, to the force limit of the cantilever. We have a cantilever with 0 0.05 uh, newton per meter, and according to the Boltzmann equipartition theorem, the force resolution is around 15 piconewton, and we are just at 28 piconewton, very close to this. So we took the same area, the same peak force uh, set point, and uh, increased the scan rate from 0.2 hertz to 0.45 hertz. And this was now impressing and surprising. We get uh, now the tips of the microvilli on, on this image. So you look on top of the cell and just see the tips of the microvilli. It's uh, the same peak force we used in the image before, but a higher scan rate. So finally, why do we see here just the tips and not the whole microvilli? The thing is that the force we add is, uh, depends um, not only on the set point, but also on tip sample interactions. Uh, we are used to define the force we apply to the cell by the set point setting. But when you come closer to the uh, force resolution of the cantilever, then the tip sample interactions are more important regarding to the real applied vertical force. And to determine the real applied vertical force independent from the set point, we use the density plots. And the density plots are a possibility in the um, offline uh, analysis software uh, to mark an area or even the whole image and to plot all force curves um, as an overlay and uh, giving a density plot. And in this density plot, you could see the mean indentation in the separation here and also the range of forces you apply within the area you marked. And here in this example, you could see that the force ranges between 150 and, let's say, 300 piconewton. Even the set point was set to 170 piconewton. So at, at low forces like this, the real 
applied force is different from the set point and is more a range than a certain number. But still, 300, 150 to 300 picanewton are a very low force which we applied. So the click it here. So peak force stepping means that for each point of your image, for each pixel, there's a force curve. You could show this in the um, analysis software, single curve, or also multiple curves in, in an overlay to compare these curves. And then you could do background subtraction, not only uh, in real time, but uh, also here in the offline version. And by doing this, you get the new uh, background, uh, the new uh, force curves without the background. And um, after background subtraction, you could also uh, move a slider to define the uh, area, to define the position where you see your cantilever deflection, your error image. And this usually shows you uh, nice differences, nice views of, of your image. So to de determine the range of forces you apply, you could do um, the density plots over an area you specified, and there you could see how much force you really apply to the cell. Maybe this area also. So this option is really nice because that gives you the opportunity to see over a large area or even the whole image what forces did you apply to the cell. And again, this is not the peak force set point. This is the real applied force. A moment, <laughs> technically. Just one second, sorry, we just, the movie kind of took over. We'll be one second getting it back. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, almost there. Should you share again? Huh? Sharing is possible. Yes. Oh. Yeah, it's coming up. Yes. Okay. okay. Something came up. Okay, sorry. Yes. Okay. Okay, so there we go. problem solved, that's great. So as mentioned before, or several times now, it's uh, not the set point we use at very low forces, it's a real applied force and these are a set of images I showed before. The image A and B, the set point was 170 piconewton, and for C and D, the set point was 28 piconewton. But by um, reviewing the force curve using the density plots, we could uh, figure out that we, in, that we applied a real vertical force of 150 to 300 piconewton to a figure A, and uh, 150 to 250 piconewton as uh, figure B. So we do not change the set point. We just change the size, the scan size at constant um, fr scan frequency. That means the speed increases. And the change of speed uh, changes also the real applied force. There's also a dependency between speed and uh, force we could show here. Figure C, for figure C, we lowered the set point down to 28 piconewton and end up with a real applied force of 100 to 130 piconewton. 
figure D uh, was imaged with the same peak force of 28 piconewton, but what we get is uh, real vertical force by the density plots of 80 to 100 piconewton. And obviously the reduction of real applied vertical force down to 100 piconewton and below which is approximately 20% less of the force we use in image C, allows us to image the microvilli as an upright cylindrical structure so from which we could see the, the top of the tips. So together this unique background subtraction algorithm in combination with a live cell peak force QNM probe, so peak force tapping enables to visualize the brush-like microvilli in a native upright position by sensing the local peak interactions at the tip directly and at imaging forces approaching the cantilever's thermal noise. So, thank you for your attention and I hand over to Andrea. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Herman. Um, and so this gets us to the end of our prepared presentation. Um, I see a few questions already came in, um, and we'll uh, start. Well, we still have a few minutes left uh, for the session, so we'll uh, answer a few of your uh, questions. Um, I see one question that came in uh, early was, uh, what is the difference between regular force volume and the fast force volume? Maybe, Andrea, do you want to comment? Sure. Uh, um, so essentially, the key differences are um, um, how we actually do the scanning is one. So regular force volume um, did not actually um, collect the Z sensor data. So force volume was required to be done in closed loop. So that really limited how fast we could go um, because you're relying on the Z sensor information. So now we can collect that data so we can operate an open loop. Um, we've also changed the way we're scanning. So the movement of the probe now is more like a raster scanning, the bidirectional um, movement, which is very similar to what we use in all of our imaging modes. So that again allows us to go a lot faster. Um, so fundamentally what, it, what the changes did was to kind of increase the uh, rate at which we can collect the, the force curve. Um, force volume has been used for many, many years by many people um, looking at mechanical property. Um, of cells and other um, biomolecules, but it's always really been hindered by its ability to go fast um, at the cost of resolution. So you're always trying to trade off at how high of a resolution image you can get versus how long you were willing to wait to get that image and how relevant uh, temporally it was. Um, so with fast force volume, now we can go up to 300 uh, hertz, um, as opposed to what was typically, when we say the limit, it was usually about 10 hertz before your curve started to get really um, ugly looking so you couldn't really rely on the data. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, another question coming in here, um, I, I noticed repulsion forces scanning on glass slides, so when imaging cells on, in liquid on glass slides, um, um, do you have any, any uh, recommendations for avoiding repulsion or what probes do you recommend? Maybe either one of you. Uh, Repulsive forces when imaging glass. Um, usually, um, Repulsive forces you usually see if you're operating in air. So if, if you're doing, a, say, a dried sample, you'll sometimes see electro repulsive electrostatic interactions when you're looking at glass. So if you are doing dry samples, perhaps if you could put them in fluid, that'll usually take care of those um, sort of interactions. Um, all of the data on cells in this presentation was collected using the Peak Force QNM Live Cell Probe, um, which um, I would recommend. Um, right now, I know that they're not available for purchase. Um, we're, we are developing those with the system. Um, but if um, you're using uh, any other types of probes, one really good probe uh, that people use for, say, contact mode imaging is the uh, MLCT probe. Um, it's the C cantilever, which is 0 0.01 Newton per meter. That one works really well as well. And how about the uh, image um, you showed on uh, bacterium? Was that in, uh, the question is, was it done in contact or in tapping mode, or which mode? That was done in peak force tapping. So that was the peak force tapping mode using the um, peak force QNM live cell probe. Mm -hmm. And um, there was, um, I think, uh, Herman, you showed the, the, the very detailed study of the microvilli at different force set points, and you mentioned a uh, force set point around 30 piconewton, but an applied force that was, say, 100, or in another case, maybe 100, 150 piconewton. Um, so is it, um, I guess the question is, 
is it a question of gains in the feedback loop also uh, in terms of these uh, the forces versus the the set point? So the question of tip probe tip sample interaction mm -hmm. and uh, that influences uh, the feedback and. Uh, what we did was we tried to go lower and lower and lower with a force, with a set point, until the point we get no tracking and then go back one. Mm -hmm. And uh, this ends up with a number of 28 piconewtons. And uh, after revision of the force curves, we saw 28 piconewton was not the real applied force. It was a little bit higher, but still it was extremely low. Um. There was a, another question, maybe somewhat related. Um, at these at these low forces and those force curves, we we see some some oscillations in the baseline. Uh, comment on either one on you. Um. Yeah. So so that is um, you sometimes see those the oscillation in the the baseline um, because we are those curves are being um, collected at one kilohertz, and we do do a background subtraction, but sometimes you know it's not always perfect because you, you're you're moving the the cantilever in fluid, so you may see some sort of um, oscillation in the background. Uh, we do have uh, baseline fitting um, in the uh, offline software to kind of, um, you know, make sure that that's not being, uh, you know, um, those oscillations in the baseline aren't being um, considered as part of the contact area of the curve for looking at the forces. Um, and then we also have the density plots, which kind of help remove that oscillation um, when you're looking at the overall trend. Okay. Um. Um, the microvilli, um, you mentioned you imaged them in peak force tapping. Do you think you could image them in tapping mode also? Uh, with tapping mode, it's difficult to control the absolute force values. Um, I would say it would be very difficult, uh, and there's no image peak for, uh, there's no tapping mode image of microvilli in their native upright cylindrical structures. Mm -hmm. So I think that people try to do this but uh, they were not successful. Therefore, peak force tapping uh, allows a really precise force control at the low piconewton range. With tapping modes, it's very difficult to really control forces. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the images that were shown earlier, um, which ones were done on inverted optical microscope uh, versus not? So every image that we show is actually um, captured uh, while the system was operating on the inverted optical microscope. And that was really one of the goals for this system. Um, when you're talking about bio-AFMs that are integrated with optical microscopy, you'll sometimes hear standalone configurations where the AFM has been removed from the microscope uh, in order to improve its uh, noise performance to kind of remove it from the, the optical microscope. Um, but in the case of Resolve, um, a lot of work really went into putting um, into main, the stabilizing and, and improving the performance of the system so that all that same data that you know we've shown previously on the multi-mode, for example, the DNA double helix and on our fast scan bio, that we can get that same resolution while we're on the inverted optical microscope. And because and, you know, ideally the goal is that this opens up experiments where people can get that resolution not just on a cell but on a single molecule um, while getting some sort of correlated optical data. Mm -hmm. Um, um, when you do uh, actually a, a question here on the uh, the softest samples you can uh, the softest uh, modulus you could you could measure on soft samples. Um. We haven't yet really hit our limit. We haven't really tried extremely low um, samples, but I can say that we have looked at um, gels, which are you know say 10 kilopascal, as well as cells that are down around that range. Um, but we do have interest. Some people would like to kind of see um, less than the kilopascal, but we haven't really pushed the tip to that point um, as of yet. But one really nice thing about the peak force QNM live cell probe is not only does it have that soft cantilever, the 0 0.08 newton per meter, which kind of allows us to, to look at these soft samples, it does have a fixed end radius. And what happens a lot of times um, when you're using regular probes is they have a very sharp tip, say, you know, 2, 10 nanometers uh, end radius. On the um, and what happens is when you're looking at really soft samples, you get too much pressure at one uh, point, and you kind of end up poking through the sample. So with the 65 nanometer uh, in radius, obviously we don't compromise um, resolution, 
because um, as you saw from Herman's data, we are resolving the microvilli on top of the cells, but at the same time, the slightly larger uh, radius allows us to look at soft um, nanomechanical properties. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, Herman, for the uh, live cell, the, the microvilli studies, um, the question is, um, what medium were they in? Um, did you uh, control the CO2 concentration too, or, or not? No, what is in the, this was done in HEPIS uh, buffer. Because uh, up to now there is no incubation system available for uh, the standard cell culture medium. We need CO2 atmosphere, um, so this was done in HEPIS buffer. Okay, well, thank you. Um, oh, yeah, Andrew, you have a yes. Uh, when when we did those studies with Herman, um, we did not have a, a incubation chamber available. Um, but with the PSI now, um, people could if they wanted to. We wanted to repeat these studies. We could do them in cell medium and control the, the CO2 levels around the cells. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both, uh, Andrea and uh, Herman. And uh, thank you to the audience for joining us today. Uh, we're at the end of our time for today. Um, yeah, we hope uh, you found this information interesting today, and we hope you join us again soon for our next webinar. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye for today. Thank you. Bye.